Hi, John DeWire here and uh, welcome to this tutorial on how to put a marketing plan together for your business. Um, I know what it's like when you look up Google or perhaps you buy a book uh, on a subject matter that uh, you want to learn more about. Um, it gets a bit boring at times, doesn't it? I've looked up lots of tutorials, whether it be YouTube or whether it be articles on Google, on, on all sorts of subjects. And it gets too deep and meaningful, so I'm going to try and make this really, really simple and hopefully pretty interesting for you to put together a marketing plan for your business. Um, number one, what you need to do is determine, are you a business to business company? In other words, your clients are other businesses, or are you a business to consumer company? Um, once you've done that, then you sit down and start to put together your business plan. And if I ask most businesses when I first meet them, um, who's your target audience? Um, normally they say to me, oh, well, anyone with a pulse. Um, look, you know that is not the case for your business. You know you, know you have a particular target audience that you should be uh, looking for. And um, most people, when I do ask them, well, okay, think about this. Whose attention do you want to get? They'll say, well, everybody. Well, no, you don't. You only want the attention of those who are interested in your business. So number one, I, well, number one, I said determine what sort of business you are. So therefore, number two, I should say, is to determine your target audience. Okay, make up your mind who your target audience is. Okay, so how do you identify your target audience? Pretty simple, just work out how old they should be or how old they are, um, whether they're male or female, um, what sort of income levels do they have, um, what's their family situation, are they married, are they perhaps single, um, are they a, a, a university student? Um, it's basically called geodemographic profiling, so you need to determine very clearly who your target audience is. So for example, if you were a hardware store, I'd say it would be pretty unlikely that little old ladies would be your target audience. Okay, So that's as simple as that. It's just a matter of determining who your target audience is. Um, the other thing that you need to do, of course, is to de determine at the moment, are you collecting customer details? That's very, very important. So point number three is determine if you are currently collecting customer database details. Because if you are, then you can search through that and have a look at what your customer looks like. The whole idea at the end of the day is to look for your most, well sorry, identify your most profitable customer and then look for more people like him or her. Um, you've heard of the 80-20 rule where, you know, I'm sure your business has exactly the same principles and that is you're earning 80% of your income from 20% of your customers. Just determine what that 20% of your customers looks like, in other words the most profitable customer, and then go out and look for more people who look like them. Simple as that, isn't it? Okay, next point. Research. Okay, take a, please take a deep breath and say, <laughs> I know it's boring, but we have to do it. So aside from researching a database, if you currently have it, to determine what your customers look like, the other form of research um, is A and B. A being qualitative and B being quantitative. Now let me tell you what qualitative and quantitative research is all about. Um, qualitative research basically explores the attitudes the behaviour and the experiences of people. Um, so for example, you might hold a focus group or two or three or four, and focus groups normally would have half a dozen people in them, uh, sometimes seven, eight, maybe up to 10. And you get three or four of these focus groups together and ask them what their feelings are towards your business. So qualitative research is all about, I guess, the warm and fuzzies. What do people feel about your company? What do they feel about your advertising? What do they feel about your products? Um, I guess it's the attitudes and the behaviour um, of your customers that you're really after in a qualitative research study. Um, you've probably been invited to one or two of them yourself. You've probably been asked over the years, would you like to be part of a focus group where they ask qualitative questions about a business or a product. I've been to a couple back in my early days for Cadbury Chocolates. Our quantitative research um, generates statistics through the use of large-scale survey research. So, for example, you might use methods such as uh, questionnaires or structured interviews. Um, if a market researcher has stopped you in the street at any time, you probably know what I'm talking about. Or if you've filled in a questionnaire, uh, which has arrived through the post, um, you know what I'm talking about. Basically, quantitative research is getting the um, choices, the opinions of people on a large scale basis. Uh, I'm sure you've had your dinner interrupted by some Indian call centre asking what you thought of a particular consumer product. That's what you know, quantitative research is all about. They call it quantitative because it has a large quantity of people 
giving responses. Um, look, at the end of the day, you really do need to know um, responses from your customers or from your prospective customers on both sides of those fences, okay, of that fence. Um, so you need qualitative research, um, and that is I would suggest you run maybe three or four groups of half a dozen people and get them in a room and provide them with a, you know, wine and, and, and perhaps a few uh, canapes and tapas and just ask them some questions about what they feel about your products or services so you get, a, you get an understanding of, I guess, their emotional attachment to your business or your products. And then the other um, form of advertising, uh, sorry, the other form of research is um, quantitative where you get a whole bunch of people respond to specific questions about your products or services. Now the other form of research that you need to do is competitive research. In other words, research on your competitors. So if you happen to be a carpet cleaner, have a look at what your other carpet cleaning companies are doing with regards to providing services or what they're doing with regards to their advertising, their marketing. Uh, it's very important for you to know what your competitors are doing. Okay, now, next uh, thing that you need to do when it comes to putting together a marketing plan is to determine when and how you're going to market. Uh, let's start with when. Uh, do you have a seasonal product? In other words, if uh, you're in the swimming pool business, then you know uh, better than anyone that there is a seasonal aspect to selling swimming pools. Um, if you're in the air conditioning business, you probably know the same thing. So um, I guess if you're a fish and chip shop, you would know that Fridays are by far and away the biggest uh, day of the week as far as fish and chips are concerned. So my, my philosophy is that uh, most of the time you should go duck shooting in the duck season. So uh, I often say that a 10% increase uh, in December, that is pre-Christmas, is for most businesses worth a 100% increase in January. So my philosophy really is go duck shooting in the duck season. So determine when you're going to market. Uh, in other words, chase the dollars when they're around um, if you're a seasonal operator. For example, I used to look after a shopping centre in a country town in Australia uh, and we only sent out our letterbox brochures and did our press and radio advertising predominantly on a pay week, a mining pay week. This was a mining town and most of the guys that were working in the mines got paid, well all of them got paid fortnightly. So it was silly for us to put out our shopping centre catalogue on the off week. We would, we would put it out on the Wednesday when they were paid every fortnight and reap the benefits. So we knew when to advertise. Now in terms of how to advertise, you need to determine that as well. Do you advertise in print? Do you advertise uh, via um, DM as in direct mail? Uh, do you advertise through letterbox brochures, through radio, through online? Uh, do you take out banner ads, um, social media, do you get involved with Facebook advertising, um, do you do Google AdWords, uh, do you create a publicity, like a PR campaign. So you've got to determine, of course, uh, when you advertise, and then you've got to uh, determine what uh, media, what measures you will use, what communication tactics you would use to communicate your sales message. Okay, so now we come to a really, really important part, and because you wouldn't expect me to... Um, to do anything but give this a big crescendo build because now we come to, you got it, your wow factor. You have to have your wow factor. Um, anybody in the advertising industry will probably tell you that uh, it's a USP, okay, it's a unique selling proposition. Um, I disagree. I think a USP is yesterday. You have to have a wow factor USP. So if you've got a product or service where you think it's got a unique selling point at the moment, just lift that up a notch and do something, create something that's a wow factor USP. And examples of that, of course, are Woolworths, four cents a litre off the petrol, uh, Harvey Norman, the uh, furniture and white goods retailer and computers, uh, two years interest free, um, McDonald's, Happy Meal has a free toy and so on and so forth. It may, well, come back to the carpet cleaner again, the carpet cleaner might have, um, we will show you how good our carpet cleaning is by giving you a free room for every room that you book. Okay, so you've got to think of your wow factor. So, whatever it is, determine what your wow factor is before you go out there and start marketing your products or services. That is so important. Otherwise, you'll be in a sea of sameness. Okay, you'll be out there with all of your other competitors looking exactly the same. Now, the other thing that you need to do, very, very important, this next point, so if you're taking these down, well, you don't need to take them down, I'm giving you a tutorial uh, booklet uh, that comes with this as well, so you don't need to take notes, that's good. Um, you have to become the expert. 
Now, I often say at my seminars uh, when I'm talking to customers, oh, sorry, my clients, um, Steve Irwin was not the only crocodile expert in the world, but as far as we were concerned, well, Steve Irwin was the crocodile man. He was a crocodile hunter, and if you wanted to know anything about crocodiles, you would Google Steve Irwin's uh, name, wouldn't you? Likewise, at the moment, the master chefs that are behind the MasterChef TV phenomena, they're not the only cooks, they're not the only chefs in the world, but at the moment, because they have marketed themselves as the expert, we all go and buy their books at the supermarkets or in the bookstores. They are, as far as we're all concerned, the chef experts. And uh, here in Australia, from a gardening point of view, um, you would, you know, any Australians watching this would know Don Burke. He's a gardening expert. Now, you know, he's not the only gardening expert in Australia, but as far as nine out of ten people are concerned, if you ask them who is the expert in Australia when it comes to gardening, they would tell you that it was Don Burke and so on and so forth. I could talk about Gordon Ramsay when it comes to cooking and the Naked Chef uh, from out of the UK. Uh, you've got to become the expert at whatever business you're in and that's very easy. You just promote yourself as the expert. Now you would not be part of my program had I said to you that well I'm okay at marketing. No, I believe wholeheartedly that I'm an expert at marketing and that's what I promote myself as. I promote myself as the wow factor guy showing you how to increase sales for your business and I attract clients because of that. Okay, next point. You've got to determine your sales creative. Okay, and it goes without saying, I'm going to preach what I normally do and that is you have to use emotional direct response marketing tactics. Now, unless you're Coca-Cola or uh, McDonald's or Kodak or Walt Disney, I'm guessing you don't have tens of millions of dollars of budget to spend. If you're a small to medium sized business, you need to get a dollar back for every dollar you spend or you'd love to get two dollars back for every dollar you spend on marketing. Now the way to have a good chance of doing that, aside from what I've already told you with you know determining your wow factor, is that you need to follow the emotional direct response formula. And number one is, you have to highlight to your target audience what their problem is. Okay, so for example, uh, if they're overweight, you would be saying, are you overweight and embarrassed to go to the beach this year with your swimwear? Um, and then number two, you exaggerate that problem and you would say to them, well, look, it isn't going to get any better unless you do something about it. Number three, you provide the solution. And that solution might be a dietary program, it might be an exercise program, uh, but you highlight the solution. The next point is that you provide them with proof of your product's benefits. And so therefore that normally comes through testimonials and you'd be very familiar with those in the weight loss industry. And last but not least, you provide a call to action. And the call to action normally is ring this phone number or go to this website. So just take note of those again, whatever product uh, or service category that you're in. Number one, identify the clients or the prospects problem. Number two, exaggerate that problem. In other words, make them feel uh, that they desperately need a solution to that problem. It, it isn't going to get any better unless they actually look for a solution. And then bingo, the next point is, of course, you provide them with the solution. Uh, next point, provide them with proof, which is normally testimonials. And the next point, call to action. Let me give you an example of that. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Let's, let's say um, you're a builder, okay? Um, and your problem identification for your prospects in, let's say it's the the home and garden lift out section of the newspaper, the headline might be, um, when I say build it, let's say you're, you're, a, uh, you're, an ex, you're a builder that, that, that uh, specialises in extensions. Okay, that'll be an easier one for me to explain to you. And so therefore, he, you know, you put on granny fats, flats or you put on extra, you know, extra rooms in the home um, and you're after people that are looking for extensions. Well, your headline would probably be, is your house too small? and you need more room for your teenagers, or are you intending uh, to um, um, you know, invite your parents to live with you? Or it could be just the headline that is your home too small, simple as that. And then you exaggerate the problem by saying, well, things aren't going to get any better unless you look at either leaving your home, um, which you won't want to do because it's your family home, or you think about a cost-effective way of increasing the size of the home. So therefore you've exaggerated the problem for them. Now you give them the solution. ABC uh, extensions can provide you with the solution for less than X dollars. 
Then you provide them with some proof, which would be a testimonial or two or three of people who have had you build extensions to their homes. And then, of course, the last thing, call to action. Call this number or go to the website. So it's pretty simple, isn't it? And what's called, um, it's, it's what's called, I should say, emotional direct response marketing. So make sure that whatever you do, you use that uh, formula when you're thinking about putting a campaign together. Just sit down and make sure you tick all of those five boxes. Okay, so look, that's essentially um, the components of my tutorial uh, for putting together a marketing plan. I told you right from the outset of this video that I was going to try and make this as simple as possible for you to follow because I know what it's like in business. I mean, you've got lots and lots of other things to do outside of marketing, but I think you probably recognize that marketing just about is the most important thing, aside from having a good product or service, of course, but marketing is more important than your IT. It's more important than, um, I guess, your book work. Um, it's more important than almost anything because without good marketing, you won't have any sales, you won't have any customers. So look, I just hope that that particular list of things that you need to go through when you're putting a marketing plan together is a benefit for you, uh, a benefit to you I should say. Um, let me just finish off though by um, giving you some other tips, some other marketing tips that you should be considering when you're sitting down put a, uh, to put a marketing plan together. Um, number one, do you have a website? And uh, I hope you do, but I can understand some businesses just haven't got around to doing that at the moment. And if you don't have a website, please, for goodness sake, do yourself a favour. You have to have a website. Um, you can imagine that you know any person these days that wants to deal with your business would be expecting that you would have a website. Um, it's just an expectation. It's it's pretty much um, uh, you know it's. What can I say? That you, there is no excuse for not having a website now. If you can't afford a five or six or seven page website, think about having just a landing page. And a landing page is um, just a one page website. Now it might scroll for a number of pages, so it might go two or three pages, and I'm sure that you've you know, probably landed on landing pages yourself from time to time. But they are very inexpensive to put together. Um, just it's a matter of just Googling landing page um, designers or website designers and you'll come across a whole bunch of them. If you need any help in that regard, let me know. But uh, if you don't have a website, just put a landing page together to start with and that'll get you out of trouble. Um, the other thing I think that you should definitely um, ask yourself and that is, am I collecting a database? Now, I often give the example of my wife and myself going to a restaurant, in fact, any restaurant, um, and have we ever been asked for our name and email address? No, absolutely not. There may have been a fishbowl near the cash register from time to time with a crummy little sign that says you could win a dinner for two if you put your business card in there. And it always has like six or seven or eight business cards because nobody ever sees it. But the easiest thing in the world for a restaurant is to have the waiter, the waiter or the waitress come up at the end of the meal and give you the bill and say, look, here's an entry form for you to win for your entire family and friends, up to 15 people, uh, a dinner in our restaurant. We give one away a month. Now, um, just fill this in as you get your MasterCard out and uh, you're in the draw. And uh, I would go as far as to say that if it was my restaurant, I would make sure the waiter uh, or the waitress just about insists that that form is filled in. Can you imagine how valuable the database will be for that restaurant? As I've said many times over, if that restaurant was being sold at any time, and they got half a million dollars for the restaurant based on their trading figures, I reckon you could add another $100,000 to that sale price if they said to the purchaser, look, how would you like 14,800 names and email addresses of all the people that have dined at this restaurant? Can you imagine how valuable that database would be? I think it would add another 20% to the sale price. So look, just ask yourself, do you have a database? And if you don't, please get one straight away. Don't feel too bad if you don't, by the way, because um, uh, Ask yourself this question, when you've been to Bunnings, do they ask you for your name and your email? No. McDonald's? No. Woolworths, unless you're part of one of their, you know, sort of rewards clubs, but, you know, I'm not. And I go into Woolworths quite often. They don't have my details. Um, I often say at my seminars, I show a picture of 82,000 people at the Sydney um, Stadium uh, for State of Origin. Rugby League has not one name, not one email of any of those 82,000 people that have come into the stadium to watch the State of Origin. Ticketek, the actual sales agency does, but not the Rugby League, they don't have any deal with Ticketek. 
So don't feel too bad because there are hardly anybody out there other than Amazon and, and Google and uh, Facebook and a whole bunch of smart operators. Uh, there are hardly anyone outside of them that are collecting databases. I cannot understand it. It is the most valuable thing in the world. So please start collecting a database. Now, if you do have a database, exploit it. In other words, just don't let it sit there. Make sure you send out newsletters. Newsletters are a wonderful way of keeping in contact and communicating with your database. And even if it's only a one or two page email newsletter, just send out a regular newsletter to your database. Keep in contact with them. And of course, if you have any fantastic expos or sales coming up, then do likewise. Make sure that you communicate that to your database. It's no good having a database if you don't use it. Now, another tip, video testimonials. Not just written testimonials, but video testimonials. Have you grabbed them? You're probably shaking your head. Make sure you get as many video testimonials as you possibly can, because can you imagine how much more compelling your landing page or your website would be with video testimonials? Just jump onto YouTube and you'll see just how easy it is. It's just a matter of getting your little digital camera out and throwing it in front of your customers when they come into your store or they come into your business or they come into your office. If you're a business to business um, company, just if you've done a fantastic thing for someone, and let's hope you do because you're running a fantastic business, um, just grab the camera and say, look, do you mind if you could just say a couple of nice words about how we treated you or how the product or service was? You will find that the video testimonial you'll get is worth 10 times a written testimonial. And it stands to reason because it's almost as if, if someone's watching that on your website, uh, it's almost as if they're just talking over the back fence with someone who is telling them about your restaurant or about your carpet cleaning business or about your landscaping business or uh, about your pool cleaning business or whatever it may be. So use video testimonials wherever you possibly can. Okay, now another tip. Staff uniforms. Um, not necessary if your staff are you know, what I'd call back of house. If your staff are not meeting clients or customers, obviously there's little need for uniforms. But if you're in the business where staff are meeting your clients, then think about uniforms. Um, you know that if you walked into a fast food outlet and they were just in their flannelette shirts and, uh, and jeans, I don't think you would have the same feeling towards McDonald's or KFC if that was the case. They're in uniforms. Um, if you walked into a hospital, I think you would expect to see the doctors and nurses in uniforms. So just consider what a uniform could do in terms of the ambience and the personality for your business. Um, I caught a cab the other day and I was blown away. The cab driver just had a sort of a car key shirt on with uh, little lapels here, almost like a, I don't know, it was almost like a military <laughs> shirt, a military uniform. Um, but it just gave a whole different feel to that cab ride. Um, so just think about uniforms and whether or not they can do uh, something for the ambience of your business. Um, sales tactics, do your people over deliver? You know, if you're a rent-a-car business, do you put a box of roses chocolates in the passenger seat when someone's, you know, renting your vehicle? Um, and that's not a wow factor as such in that that would make you go and get that rent-a-car. So I'm not talking about a wow factor because I doubt very much whether a box of chocolates would make you, you know, choose one rental, rental company over another. But certainly if you got in the rent-a-car and you turned the ignition on, you started to drive and you looked beside you and there's a lovely complimentary note with a box of chocolates there, I think it would make you feel pretty good about that rent-a-car. So just ask yourself, do your salespeople go above and beyond the call of duty with little extras like that? Um, and in terms of your staff, do you motivate them? Um, I have to say that if you know, you've got a whole bunch of salespeople and there are, there's not a bonus system, an incentive system built in, well, you've got to think about that. Um, salespeople are born to be motivated by incentives, so just make sure you have an incentive for your salespeople. Um, and by the way, if you're the expert, make sure that your sales staff are also the experts. So even though Steve Irwin, who I've brought up before in this tutorial, has sadly passed away, if you go to Australia Zoo now, you will find that he very cleverly trained a whole bunch of people under him uh, to be, guess what, experts. And so therefore, while Steve unfortunately is no longer with us, every single staff member at Australia Zoo comes across as an expert. Now I know that because I took my family there not so long ago and we were so impressed with the fact that everyone within the zoo not only had fantastic uniforms, um, but they also were all coming across as experts. Okay, now another tip. Give yourself a, um, what would you call it? I guess, um, well, yeah, give yourself a health check. 
have a look at your marketing at the moment and determine if your marketing has all of the ingredients that I've discussed in this tutorial. Um, have a look whether or not your marketing is based on proper research. Have a look at whether or not you are targeting the right people, as in your most profitable customers. Have you identified your most profitable customer and then you're looking for more people who look like him? Uh, if you're not, then get back and have a look at that research. Um, are you using the right media um, or communications? Are you using you know, television or radio or direct marketing? Are you using letterbox brochures? Are you using the most cost-effective communication tactics to get to your customers? Uh, Facebook advertising, for example, I, I quote a number of times, it blew me away recently. Um, even I didn't realise just how powerful Facebook advertising is. I had a seminar on the Gold Coast and uh, I ended up getting uh, well above what I expected in terms of registrations. I think we were expecting maybe 200 res registrations. We got 338 registrations and a third of those came through Facebook advertising. And all we did uh, is that we laser targeted people in Brisbane and people in the Gold Coast, because the seminar was on the Gold Coast, whose Facebook profiles indicated that they had a uh, an interest in seminars, an interest in small business marketing, an interest in just in small business. So therefore we targeted through that geodemographic profiling only people in Brisbane because that was within an hour's drive and people on the Gold Coast whose profiles in their Facebook page had indicated that they had a desire to learn more about small business. You know what? We got a third of our registration. So that's a third of nearly 340 people came through Facebook advertising. And you know what it cost me? Less than $50 a day. We just put a $50 budget against it per day, and I think we ran it for eight days. So for $400, I had a hundred and something people in my conference. Unbelievable return on investment. So think about um, the sort of marketing that you're doing, and is it cost effectively bringing you um, customers or sales? And obviously, the easiest way to work that out is um, determining what your cost per sale is. The amount of dollars you spend on advertising versus the amount of uh, sales that you make from it. Um, free. Free, free, okay. <laughs> Normally you get people's attention when you yell out free. It's a pretty powerful word. In fact, I think next to fire, it's about the most powerful word in the English language. Um, and I won't yell out fire. Um, if you use free in your uh, advertising, you will be amazed at the response level you get. Um, whether it be a free report, or whether it be buy one, get one free, or whether it be a free bonus of any sort, Consider that as a component of your marketing. Now, it may be your wow factor or it might be additional to your wow factor, but consider what you can give away for free or how you can use the word free in your marketing and you'll be, you'll be blown away with the response levels that you get when you use that magical four-letter word, four letter word. Sorry, how many fingers? Four-letter word, free. Um, benefits, another tip, benefits. Now, write that down if you've got a pen in front of you. Don't advertise your features. Advertise your benefits. And I'll give you an example. I have uh, a client who happens to be in the weight loss game and they have uh, shakes. Uh, basically, you the, the powder sach sachets come with their program. You empty the sachet into a, um, into a mixer and you put water in and you shake it up and down and pour it into your glass and you've got this delicious chocolate or strawberry or vanilla milkshake. Now, um, they were, they've got a great business, but they were marketing the features of that product. And it is a medically um, endorsed product, and so therefore they were going out of their way to be rather anal, I guess you would call it, specific, in terms of the medical features of this product. You know what? Uh, Jennifer, Susan, Catherine, Bill, Charlie, Tom, who are overweight and want to lose weight, they're not interested, at least in the first instance, they're not interested in the features. They're just not. They want to know that if they take this shake, it'll lose kilos, it'll lose weight for them. And so what I've convinced this particular client to do is to make sure that their headline and their subheadline and the first part of their body copy in any print advertisement is all about the benefits. So it would be, um, are you overweight? In other words, deliver the problem and just don't know what to do about it because you've tried everything else. Now we come into the solution. How would you love to enjoy a tasty chocolate shake and lose up to eight kilos in the first four weeks? Now you've got a pretty powerful headline. 
Then as you get into the description of the product and, uh, and what it's all about, then of course you can bring up the features. But highlight the benefits more than the features. People are wanting to know what is it that I'll get, what's the feeling uh, and what's the enjoyment, what are the benefits I will get from your product or service uh, before you start getting into what normally are boring features. Okay, so look at the benefits, not the features. Okay, now the other tip is to create a sense of urgency. Whatever you do, don't let your marketing messages get out there without a sense of urgency. Now the sense of urgency can be that you've only got a limited amount of stock, or the sense of urgency could be that it's only available until Friday at 5 o'clock. Um, normally it's either limited quantity or limited time. Um, so if you were selling for argument's sake a refrigerator, you wouldn't just have a refrigerator with a price and the benefits and features, you would have a refrigerator with a special bonus, and I don't know what that would be. It might be a, um, uh, could be a, you know, a, a free TV with it. It could be a, a free microwave that comes with the refrigerator. Whatever it is, the bonus um, has to have a time limit to it, or it has to have a quantity limit. So therefore, uh, the, all, all, just even if it was a refrigerator by itself, it's only available for this particular package price until Friday at five o'clock. Or we only have so many of them. So make sure that you always build in some sort of scarcity factor. Another tip, repetitive trade. Now, think about it. Are you in a business that you can stimulate repetitive trade? And I've often said to people, I just loved the time that I was involved with the football cards. Uh, I, in the 90s, had the business that took over from Scanlon's Bubblegum, and we snared the, um, oh, pretty much most of the major licenses for Bubblegum cards. And so whether it was the Batman movie coming out or Jurassic Park or Disney's Aladdin uh, or the NRL Rugby League, we had the bubblegum card license. And the great thing about that was that I could give out a whole lot of free little cardboard um, cards with the Sunday paper. So let's say it was in the Rugby League instance, the kids would you know, get mum and dad to buy the Sunday paper and I would get the Sunday newspaper um, to hand out free Mel Meninga and Alfie Langer cards, I think it was back in the 90s. And then, of course, the kids would get a taste test of these cards and have to run off to the news agency and spend $2 to get the packet of football cards, my packet of bubblegum football cards. And, of course, inside each packet were six or seven cards. There were about 250 to the set, which meant they would have to come back and keep on buying my $2 packs of cards to collect the whole 250 cards in the set. What did that do? I benefited from continuity. So think about how you can get people to repetitively come back to your business. Now, whether that's through a loyalty card, and we've seen lots of coffee shops do that, where you buy nine coffees when they stamp the little card, you get the 10th one for free, um, or whether it be that you can set up a reward system where they get points every time that they spend a certain amount of money with you, and they can redeem, uh, once they get to a certain level, they can redeem those points for a free gift or a bonus. But whatever it is, try and think of a way that you can repetitively get people to return and buy your product or service. I often say for, um, uh, for, for tradesmen, for example, a lawn mowing um, guy that would come and you know, basically you know, do the hedges and, and the gardens and mow the lawn, why wouldn't he try and stitch up a customer by giving them a coupon book of six months worth of you know, lawn mowing? Uh, and they get a 20% discount for that. Now, I know that I keep on going on about, look, I don't want you to market on price, but you know, at times like that, when you can stitch somebody, somebody up for six months, it is worth giving a 10 or 20% discount, for goodness sake. Because otherwise, really, the guy that does our lawns, we just ring him up when we want, but if there was someone that was smart enough to put another leaflet in our letterbox, who knows, we might swap. I don't think we would, we're pretty happy with our guy, but I'm just saying that if you wanted to stimulate repetitive trade and loyalty, why not offer some six month bulk discount if they commit to six months? Now, in terms of repetitive trade, I'm sure you've heard that it costs about seven times more to get a new client than it does to keep the existing one. So it pays a lot of dividends to do whatever you need to do and maybe give away 20% of your margin um, to retain the current customer because it'll cost you a lot more than that to replace him. A uh, Couple more and then we're done, mystery shoppers. Try and make sure that you get some mystery shopping done for your business, okay? Because you might find out things that you just never knew were happening. Uh, I know a particular building society um, that I'm involved in, from time to time they do some mystery shopping out around their branches and they are quite surprised at what they learn when they send somebody into their, uh, their banking branches and see what goes on at the coalface. So try and get some mystery shopping done for your business because I think you might be quite surprised at what you would find. 
Um, last but not least, um, what I would call affinity relationships, and that is finding another business who you can create a, a joint venture style relationship and you share their database and they share yours. Now normally, of course, that would not be um, a competitor. You would find someone who uh, would be oh, someone in a similar sort of category as yours, but not a competitor. So for example, if you're in the business of uh, cleaning pools, you might get together with someone who sells pools, for example. Um, or you might get together with a pool shop um, so that you can share each other's database. If you're in the business of um, landscaping and looking after people's gardens, then you might get together with a nursery, a landscaping nursery, because it stands to reason when someone goes in and buys plants from the nursery, they're probably going to be looking for some advice from the likes of yourself, someone that actually looks after nurturing and, um, and I guess looking after the garden of various you know, household clients. So whatever it might be, just think about the way that you can find um, an affinity partner, someone that's involved in your industry but is not a competitor that you can share databases with and therefore both of you come out ahead. It's, I guess it's the, uh, what is it, the mutually beneficial relationship. Look, that's about it. I uh, hope that you've enjoyed this tutorial um, on how to create a marketing plan and uh, the bonus that I threw at the end of it, and that is a whole bunch of tips uh, once you've created your marketing plan, a whole bunch of tips of how you can exploit uh, marketing tactics. Um, if you would like any more information on uh, how to drive business via a uh, well thought out marketing plan, then don't hesitate to contact us at the Institute of Wow. But for the moment, it's John DeWire, over and out.